Good evening, everybody. Great to see a good group out tonight. We're going to we have a bit together for about a month and a half now because of Christmas and a lot of things going on here at church. And uh, so we're going to try to get back at it tonight. Now, what I'm planning on doing, we are going to cover a lot of ground fast tonight because I want to do a lot of review, but going back to really chapter four. Now, the reason for that, I want to try to cover most of the ground that we've covered pertaining to the seven year great tribulation period okay of course we started for some of our new people tonight we we started this study what four years ago patty something like that well, yeah. april 15 2012 so it's been a while we started this with a dispensational study now there's several ways to approach the bible and study you can study the Bible dispensationally. You can study it from a covenant standpoint. There's a lot of different ways to go at the Bible and to interpret, it, to interpret it. I've always taught Revelation from a dispensational standpoint. If you understand dispensation, there's seven times in the Bible that God has dealt with man or is going to deal with man differently. And we ran through the dis seven dispensations to start with. What we are in right now is called the dispensation of grace, which is the sixth dispensation on that time frame okay it's also called the church age it's called also the times of the Gentiles so those are three terms that are given to the era that we're living in right now this tribulation period that we're talking about the great tribulation period is at the end of the sixth dispensation it's the transition between the dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the kingdom age which is coming a thousand year reign We'll see that when we finally get to Revelation chapter 20. We'll talk about the, the kingdom age, which is the fulfillment of a lot of the Old Testament promises that God gave Israel about the kingdom of David and he was going to sit on the throne and all these types of things. That'll take place during the kingdom age. All right, so that's the seventh dispensation. But right now we're getting, I believe we're in the last days. I believe we're, we're looking at uh, uh, most of the Old, Old Testament and even a lot of the New Testament prophecies that Jesus gave us about the, the, the end times, the coming of the day of the Lord, is at hand. Whereas a few things, one being that I'm looking for is the rebuilding of the, of the temple in Jerusalem. When the, is, when the Jews start that, I'm going to walk around looking up all the time because Jesus is coming. Okay, But I believe that's getting ready to take place. I know they've already got materials together. They've got plans. The, the, the issue right now is probably the the, the Dome of the Rock sitting on Mount Moriah. But once they solve that issue, Israel's going to break, down, break ground on their new temple, which is where Satan is going to set himself up to rule and reign and, and create the abomination of desolations in Daniel chapter 9. So those are some issues that, that I'm looking forward as far as uh, in the future. If the Lord keeps me around here much longer, I'm kind of waiting for those things to start happening. But I truly believe as a pastor and a student of prophecy for over 40 years, for almost, over, almost 45 years now, I fully believe we're living in the last days. There is one thing I do know. We're closer than we were 45 years ago when I first started studying it, okay? But it is coming, and it's coming quick. I see us like a freight train downhill. So we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. Also, uh, I'm kind of jumping over chapters 2 and 3, which is the seven messages to the seven churches in Asia. Uh, the main reason I'm doing that, we covered it in depth when we started this study uh, it really has uh, relevance to where the church, I mean, depending on how you apply that, those, those teachings. Remember, I said there's three ways to apply it. You can apply it to the literal churches that were in Asia at the time. The, a lot of people try to apply it to seven different stages that the church has gone through over the years, which is another way to look at the dispensational study of the church. I'm not sure all of that applies, but... People like to look at it that way. It also, you can see it in actual churches around us today. You see a Laodicean church, you see a Philadelphia church, and so forth. You know, in different churches today, you see dead churches, you see one like ours that's alive and, and well, and, and, and so, you know, you can, you can do that. And it also applies individually. So really there's four applications there. That, you know, how we ourselves, some people are, they're, they're, even though they're saved, they're lukewarm, uh, others uh, that are saved are on fire for Jesus and everything in between. So you see those patterns that you see in those seven churches. 
you see them in individual lives as well. But what I really want to focus on is starting with chapter 4. And we're going to run through to the first verse of chapter 15 tonight. We're, we're going to we'll get back in this now every other week or so, we hope. We'll be start picking up at chapter 15, and hopefully by the next four years, we'll get the, we'll get the book done. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's going to get really messy starting in chapter 15. Chapter 15 starts with the vile judgments, and that's the final judgments that God pours out, foreclosing on the title deed of the earth, and he's pouring out his wrath, and the Bible says without measure. So there won't be any more grace. God's done playing around with people. He's going to bring it to an end, and he's going to start pouring out his wrath. So we're going to be looking at that in future weeks. We're going to, we're going to come up to speed tonight to chapter 15, verse 1. But I'd like to start here uh, tonight with chapter 4. We covered uh, real quickly John. We talked about John being translated up into, into heaven. Now, a lot of people think maybe it was done in dreams. I happen to believe he probably was translated up into heaven. Uh, actually, Mark and I were talking this morning. One of the things that you learn about the book of Revelation, John writes about stuff like it's in the present, but yet it hadn't even happened yet. So you ask yourself, how does God do that? I don't know, but ask God. But God showed John things that were going to take place far in the future, and then John tried to describe them and write them down in a book called uh, The Revelation, okay? And so at, at some point we have to use our imagination. If we were John 2,000 years ago, and God translated us up into glory and showed us a, a, a visual of a, 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 black hep, a Black Hawk helicopter shooting at something, how would you describe it as John? So there's a lot of symbolism that we, you know, people try to, I think, over-symbolize Revelation. I believe you can understand most of it without doing any symbolization. Other parts of it where you just can't even understand what God's talking about, you just have to leave it alone. And I was talking about uh, scorpion uh, tails on, on locusts that sting men. I, 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 hey, it's satanic. All I say is it, it's, it's what it is. But the first thing John sees in John chapter 4, verse 1, is he sees uh, Jesus or God sitting on the throne in glory. And he describes it. Turn to John chapter, uh, first, uh, Revelation chapter 4 real quick. Just like to read a few verses here. Verse 1, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I, that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was in, set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat on it was, to look upon was like jasper and a sardius stone. And there was rainbow around the, the throne in the sight like, like an, an emerald. And the, round about the throne more, there, more, uh, there were four and twenty uh, thrones. And upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting on the thrones clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads the, the crown of gold and so forth, and it reads on. So the first thing John sees is the heavenly vision. And he sees Christ, God, sitting on the throne in heaven. He sees the 24 elders, and you can read on. We talk quite in depth about that. What we really see here is John's first vision, uh, or in presence, if you will, of the majesty of God. That awaits us. You know, you can go back to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, and you see Isaiah saw uh, Christ sitting on the throne, and, and, and he fell on his face. He was undone, and, and the angel came and, and brought the coals and cleansed him and, and brought him up and, and stood him back on his feet and said, you know, who, who, can I send you? And he says, yes, send me. So, you know, we've seen a little bit of this vision from the Old Testament. But now we're seeing it, John describing what he saw in heaven first off. First off. And I kind of believe when we get there, this is going to be our first entry. Okay, in the glory. We're going to see God sitting on the throne. We're going to see this throne room. We're going to see all the beauty and everything, and, 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 and it's going to be unbelievable. Okay, so John sort of gives us a little vent, vent, uh, look into heaven itself. You notice he uses these stones to describe these things. Uh, I actually was talking with a, with a person uh, Friday about this same thing. We are talking about the, the stones themselves and, and how the God uses the jasper and the sardius stones and all this kind of stuff to describe. He used it in the building of the temple. He used it in the building of the ephod. 
and we see it in heaven as, as well. And we see all these beautiful stones and stuff. So we're going to see it in the new Jerusalem. When he brings the new Jerusalem back, we're going to see him using all this beauty that he's created. Okay? So we worship a pretty neat God. And uh, the, I guess the point that it starts off with here is beauty in heaven. You're going to see here as we talk about this, uh, we're going to see the heavenly realm off and on throughout this book. We're going to also see the earthly realm. And we're going to be, keep going back and forth at different times, most of it in parenthetical teaching when we start talking about what's going on in heaven while all the hell's breaking loose on earth. But every once in a while we're going to get a glimpse back up into heaven and usually the saints are there and they're around the throne and this kind of stuff. So, you know, the, the book is, it talks about both the heavenly realm and the earthly realm here, okay? Uh, the rainbow, of course, we know that is the promise that God was never going to flood the earth again. Uh, I had a unique opportunity recently to see a beautiful uh, double rainbow. And I don't know how many of you know this or not. It, it, I, here I am, I'm in my mid-60s, but I had never realized when you see a double rainbow, the colors are in reverse on the second one. Did you know that? Yeah, they're in reverse than what they are on the first one. When you see a second rainbow, the colors are reversed. It's really cool. Actually, I, I guess Scott knew about it. I, I was all excited and told Scott, and he says, yeah, I know that. I, you know, I hate that kid at times. You know, I just know. <laughs> but the rainbow is, is I believe, is, it's in heaven, and it's nothing more to me as a continuation of the promises that God is God. We can trust him. We can have faith in him. And as he gave the promise, he'd never flood the earth again. When we get to heaven, guess what we're going to see? We're going to see a rainbow clear across the, the, the heavenly realm there, the throne room, is a, is a, is a rainbow. So I, I love the symbol, symbolism here. Uh, we also talked about, we read here in, in chapter 4 about the 24 elders, and they have 24 crowns. Uh, we talked a little bit about the crowns that we can earn as, as believers for uh, being excited about his coming, and, and there's crowns for preaching and teaching and different things. There's crowns that we can earn as well. When it's all said and done, we're going to throw our crowns at Jesus' feet because none of us deserve crowns anyhow, right? I mean, by, by, this, by the grace of God, uh, you know, we get there. But God is all about rewarding believers. He wants us to succeed. He wants us uh, to, to serve him. He wants to reward us for, for, for faithful service. And uh, so we see the elders there. Uh, Mark and I were talking this morning about who the elders are. I really don't care. Uh, you, can get, you can read around and get different lists of, you know, the, uh, you can, Moses and, and Abraham, and you can go back to the 12 to, to patriarchs, and then you can get the 12 apostles sitting there. I mean, you can put everybody on that throne you want. I, as a pastor, don't really care. All I look at is the literal says that there's 24 thrones, and there's 24 men sitting on the thrones, and they got crowns on their head. That's about all I care about because it's, that's a little interpretation here. But so there's going to be royalty in heaven. Uh, those that have gone before us and have really served God in a, in a, in a special way, there's going to be 24 of them exalted around the throne when we get there. And we're going to see. And they're going to be there for a reason, okay? Uh, then the thing that we really learn in the, in the heavenly realm is worship's going up all the time. The cherubim are there, the seraphim, and, and constantly it's praise going up to God and giving Him glory. Uh, we're going to see later on, you know, if you study this out, you see the, the heavenly choir. Um, I'll probably even know how to sing when I get there. Uh, you know, it's going to be a great time of, of worship around the throne room that we're going to have in this, and it's all revealed here in, in chapter 4. It's just a great, a great, great chapter, okay? Then you get to the crown of, these are the crowns here that we can receive, the crown of incorruption, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24, uh, I don't know what 24 and 24, anyhow. Crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, Crown of righteousness, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The crown of life in James uh, 1, 2 and Revelation 2, 10. And then the crown of glory in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. So those are crowns that we as believers can obtain for serving, for preaching, for being, uh, ex waiting for his coming. There's different reasons why each of those crowns are earned. You can study those out and read those, and I recommend at least choose one and go after it, Okay. It's worth doing it. It'll, it'll grow your life spiritually. Uh, so, you know, we are, it, the Bible is about rewards, and we see it here in Revelation. They're going to see it again. You see it throughout the Scriptures, all right? 
Then we get to the uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5 is, is all about finding someone worthy. We spent time back in the Old Testament. You've got to go back to the book of Ruth. You've got to study the kinsman redeemer theology of the Old Testament. Ruth was uh, redeemed by Boaz, who was the kinsman redeemer of the Messiah, uh, was able to redeem her and, re and, and make her his bride, redeem their land, and, 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 helpfully, helpful, and put she and Naomi back on their feet. Okay, And it's all about the kinsman redeemer scroll. And they're looking for someone, nobody's worthy to open the scroll. And they got this scroll with these seven seals on it, and nobody's able to, or qualified to open the scroll. The issue there, that scroll is the title deed to the earth that has been mortgaged into sin because of mankind, because of mankind's rebellion. And if you go back into that kinsman redeemer scroll theology, when you, with, if a Jew owned land but they needed some money, they would mortgage their land, they would take that scroll and give it to the, to the priest to be held in the temple. Okay? And the only one that could redeem that scroll was either the one that owned the land or if they died or whatever, the next person that came in had to prove they were a proper kinsman. They had to be proved their lineage. They had to prove that they had the money they could afford to, to, to redeem the land. They had to prove that they wanted to redeem the land. And then they had to take on anybody else that had a claim against it and prove that they were wrong and they were the kinsman redeemer. Then they could redeem that land back for the family. So it's a, it's a long, big legal thing you've got to get into in the Old Testament and go back and study it out. And that's the issue here in chapter 5 is the, who is worthy to redeem the kinsman redeemer scroll. And finally, the lamb that was slain shows up. And we know who that is, right? Christ himself, he's the one worthy to take the scroll and start foreclosing on the title deed to the earth. Now, the reason, the first thing he had to do is he had to prove that he was the lineage of God himself because God has a title deed to the earth, okay? And we all know who Jesus is, right? He's God manifested in human flesh. He paid the price by the shed blood of his, son, of, of, of his own self and his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's the price that was paid. He was willing to pay the price. He paid the price to redeem the earth out of sin. And so that's what that whole chapter 5 is about. And then when you get to chapter 6 and you see the scroll start being opened and these seals start broken, that's the issue. It's Christ now opening up these seals on that kinsman redeemer scroll. The, the title deed to the earth has been foreclosed or has been, been mortgaged by sin and Christ is getting ready to start foreclosing on it and redeeming it by executing what's written in the scrolls. And so as we go through this from chapter 6 on to chapter 18, we're going to see these scroll, these, as this scroll starts unfolding, it ends up with six seals that were broken. And then it turns into seven trumpets, and the trumpets are sounded, and each one of those are judgments. And then it, it, no, it, then it goes to, um, the, it's going to go to the vile judgments, starting at chapter 15. And the vile judgments are just totally ugly. And then it ends up in Armageddon, where Christ has to come back and lop, lop a bunch of people's heads off to get the, get the title of the earth back. Okay? So that's, that's sort of the tribulation period in a nutshell. All right, but we see it here. It's all about this kinsman redeemer scroll. Now, what we see to start with when they start opening these seals, oh, actually, first of all, the lamb is revealed. He, in chapter 5, the lamb is found worthy. You know, Christ is both the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the lion of Judah, but he's the lamb of God. And he was a lamb slain for the sins of the world. Okay? But on the other side, he's the king of kings and lord of lords in the line of Judah, being the ruler of, of, the, of Israel. Okay? We see that. Then the scroll is handed to Christ, and he's the one that is worthy to start opening the scroll. And uh, verse, let's just take verse, chapter 6 here, verse 1 through 17. They, he starts opening the scrolls. Okay? It starts with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, one of the things that you have to, we struggle with, and, and I'm not one that 
tries to set dates and get definitive and all this stuff. But the book of Revelation does not run on a nice, neat, chronological order. Okay? I believe these, this right here is setting the stage for the entire seven-year period. Okay? As these scrolls are start, seals are broken, it's setting what's going to happen over the long haul throughout this whole period. It's going to set kind of the, the backstage, if you will. Everything piles on top of it. One of the things you learn about these judgments is they are uh, continually get worse and worse and pile on top of each other. Okay? They add two. They get worse. And they just add some more. And then they add some more. All right? So it starts with the first thing we see here in the, kins in the four horsemen of the apocalypse is the first horse, which is the white horse, which we identify as Satan. We see that God gives him his authority to take over the earth. Okay? He comes to power. He's riding a white horse, which is a symbol for peace. We read in Daniel chapter 9 where he's going to sign a seven-year peace, 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 peace treaty with Israel. Okay? He, he's carrying a bow with no arrow, so he's going to take over the earth without military conquest. And then immediately he's going to start wreaking havoc. Okay? So that's what the white horse is about. It's showing us that as we talk about Satan setting up a one world, new world order and taking over the earth, that's all part of that white horse. And again, his authority comes from God himself. God's allowing it to happen. It's part of that spiritual battle that's been going on for thousands of years between God and Satan. And God's going to give Satan his, his, his opportunity to try to reign over the earth. Okay? Then we have the second seal, which is Satan's Antichrist comes, and he takes peace from the earth and worldwide dictatorship and rules by force. And that's the red horse, or the, uh, is it pale horse? What's the second one? Forget my colors here. It's red. Okay, that's the red horse. And he, he, starts, he starts warfare, and he starts killing people by force. Either they fall in line with Satan's uh, new rule, or he's just going to exterminate you. And he starts, it, it turns into a dictatorship very quickly, a worldwide dictatorship. Remember, he comes, to, he comes to power. One of the things we pointed out that I believe because the wisdom of man is foolishness to God, I believe Satan is going to use man's wisdom against him. The reason he's going to be able to take over is because everything he says is going to make logical sense to mankind. For instance, we're going to solve worldwide poverty. We're going to, all these one percenters are going to stop blowing all their money on worthless stuff, and they're going to start feeding the rest of the world. That type of mentality, which you hear politically today. Okay? We're going to get together, and we're going to save the planet. We're going to stop global warming. They're already working on that, right? I mean, we got it down now where they're going to guarantee they're, the, the world's not going to warm anymore within a, a, a one and a half degree over the next 25 years. So, you know, we're going to solve that world globing issue. Okay, we're going we're gonna to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we've got plenty of, plenty of energy and we're going to stop using oil and we're going to make sure everybody ha is driving solar cars here in the next uh, 25 years. So we're going to solve all those problems, energy problems. I mean, those are all big problems, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to solve the world population problem. We're going we're gonna to adopt China's uh, uh, one-child policy and everybody else is going to get aborted. And that's going to be worldwide instead of just China. So that way we'll cover, we'll cover the earth long term for population growth. I mean, Satan's going to have all these wonderful ideas that people are going to fall in line with that make sense. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do away with all nuclear weapons, right? Except the one Satan wants to keep. And that way that uh, we don't have to worry about nuclear proliferation anymore. And Satan's going to have the only army on the planet. So that way we'll make sure everybody stays in line. So, I mean, all of this stuff that he comes to power and he's going to be promising all this stuff is going to make total sense with mankind. But he's going to bring this all about with these four horsemen, all right? The third one is worldwide calamity. Satan, even though he promises peace and stuff, he can't, he can't help himself. He can't help himself, okay? One of the things that Salowinski talks about, and, and I believe some of our, a lot of our politicians, particularly the progressives, realize they can control by creating havoc. The more problems they cause for the masses, the more they can step up and say, we're going to solve your problems, just give us control. Okay? 
and that, that's political. And it's gone on for, for, for generations. Uh, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution took place in Russia years ago because they convinced the, the laborers, the workers, that they were being taken advantage of by the czars. We've got the same thing going on in America today, only instead of calling us the working class, they're talking about the middle class. And the politicians are going to, we want to help the middle class. The middle class has been hurt through this last financial collapse and just vote for me and I'm going to make sure I'm going to take care of the, of the little guy, the middle class. It's, it's no different. It's just, just change the terms, but it's the same policies. Okay? And Satan's going to use this stuff. But he's, he, with the, with the, the uh, pale horse is famine and it talks about for, for a year's wage to buy a loaf of bread. And it's coming. I mean, Satan, even though he takes power, it, it ain't going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And, and it's going to be pestilence and famine and, and so forth, starvation. And then the fourth seal literally is the, green, the, green work, the grim re reaper. And he's just going to exterminate people to, for the sake of uh, them not agreeing with him. And he's just going to wipe them out. So there's going to be death. When we go through this time and time again at one point between what Satan's doing and between what God's doing, we see a half of the world's population destroyed, a fourth of the world's population destroyed, a third of the world's population destroyed, uh, a third of all the fish, a third of all the plants and animals. I mean, it's going to get nasty during this seven-year period. Okay? So these four horsemen are setting the stage from Satan's standpoint of all the havoc that he's going to wreak. Because even though he's promising peace and he's promising this utopia, that's not who he is. There's no truth in him, remember? So anything he promises mankind is a lie. And he's going to do the exact opposite. So I believe this is, this is showing the, 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 the side of Satan with these four horsemen here are going to come out and start wreaking, wreaking havoc on the earth. We see the, the fifth seal is the martyred saint sitting under the throne and crying out to, to the Lord, how much longer are we going to have to put up with this before you do something? How much longer? Okay? And I almost believe that during that first three and a half year period, it's primarily going to be Satan ruling, taking over things, and Jesus sort of sitting back letting it happen. And then the trumpet judgment starts singing. <laughs> Okay, but during that first three and a half years, it's going to be Satan's parade. It's not going to be pretty. Satan's taken over, but at that, and, and it's it's going to get worse later on. He's going to t get total control later on. But I believe at this point, the, and I don't want to get too much ahead of myself here, but the false prophet's going to come forward and start promising peace and just follow me, and he's going to start bringing the religions of the world together and kumbaya and all this kind of stuff, while all this other stuff's going on. But at the same time, he's martyring saints of Christ that, are, that uh, get saved immediately after the tribulation period. And they're going to ask why. The sixth seal brings an earthquake. Great earthquake, such as never been an earthquake. You know, we've had a lot of earthquakes in my lifetime, regional. You know, I think several years ago, the one in Haiti killed a couple hundred thousand was probably the major one that in, in our, our hemisphere here. But, you know, this, I believe, is going to be almost probably a worldwide earthquake. It's going to get everybody's attention. This is the last of those uh, seals on that, on that uh, scroll out front, okay? This, the sixth one, the seventh one, of course, is, and, and Doug likes this, the blood moons, right, Doug? Uh, along with that uh, sixth seal, it talks about a blood moon. And so, Doug, what's your date now? January 15, yeah, yeah, so you can put that one in your calendar and just write it down and put a blood, blood moon. That's Doug's blood moon, so we're waiting on that one. Not any more, no more dates here, okay. Uh, then we get to chapter 7. Chapter 7 we see uh, announced or uh, introduced, if you will, the 144,000 witnesses. And no, I hate to say it's not the Jehovah's Witnesses, Okay. If you study this out, I, one of the things when I've witnessed to Jehovah's Witnesses all the time, I ask them, which tribe are you from? Because they don't know because they're not from a tribe. The 144,000 witnesses, if you read through Revelation chapter 7, it's, it's uh, 12,000 witnesses from the 12 tribes of Israel. It's 112,000, 112, 144,000 witnesses. 
Now, these are virgins, these are young men that God calls out at the beginning of the tribulation period to be his witnesses. Okay? These, these young men are sealed. They're protected by God. They can't be killed. They're going to be witnessing now. Again, you, we spent some time in Matthew 24 here. Their message is not the message we preach today. John the Baptist, when Jesus came, John the Baptist was preaching, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be baptized for the remission of your sins and repent. That was his message. That's going to be the same message these guys are going to preach. These guys, I believe, are going to know that within six or seven years, Jesus is coming back because they're going to know the revelation. And they're going to say, hey, folks, you know, uh, within the next uh, four and a half years, you best get saved because Jesus is coming back and wipe, off, wipe the planet, <laughs> you know, of sinners. And uh, so, I mean, these guys are going to be real specific, I believe, in their message. They're going to be bold. I believe most of their preaching is going to be in and around the Middle East and, and particularly Israel. Their main audience is going to be the Jews, okay? But these guys are going to be brilliant theologians. They're going to be uh, called out by God to be the witnesses in the, in the, in the Great Tribulation period. Uh, and I believe we, at this point, let me bring up the rapture theories. You know, we talked a lot about that for several weeks. I taught all three pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. Uh, we looked at the theology of all three. And then I told you that I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I believe that we, the next thing on God's calendar, really, is rapturing us out of here. I don't believe any of this really can really start till we're gone, based on uh, First Thessalonians, or Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It talks about the mystery of iniquity does already work but only him who hinders must be taken away, and I believe that's the Holy Spirit. Right now, if Satan tried to take over the church of Jesus Christ, we'd be screaming. We're the only ones that would be screaming, okay? But if we're gone, nobody's screaming, okay? Satan can have free reign tomorrow, and the world's not going to know any different tomorrow if we're gone. So that's one of the major reasons I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. That, and as, as I shared with Mark this morning, I also believe that because we are the bride of Christ, I don't see Christ pouring out his wrath on his bride. I believe he's going to take us home before he starts pouring out his wrath on this earth. Okay? So that's just uh, some theological issues on pre-tribulation. And then when all that fails, I'm chicken. So remember chicken theology, right? We believe in chicken theology around here. So, but all that, these guys are going to be introduced, I believe, very early on, uh, about the time the tribulation begins, these guys are going to be introduced, and they're going to be God's primary witnesses to win people for Christ during the tribulation period. Now, one of the things I'm asked all the time, if my loved one's left behind, are they going to be able to get saved or not? Okay? I would have you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, my answer is, Possibly not. I hate to say that to people, but the Bible is, is, is fairly clear here that if people have heard the gospel ahead of time and they rejected it at that point, they may be in deep trouble. Okay? Uh, let's start at verse 3, and I want to read down through verse 12 and have you follow along here. A couple of things are going to come out about the uh, revealing of the Antichrist, uh, the mystery of iniquity that's already worked, which I, I quoted a few minutes ago and then about this idea of what, who's going to get saved after the tribulation. Verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come the falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And we call that the abomination of desolations in Daniel chapter 9. Okay? Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what, the, what restraineth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now hindereth will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And I believe that's referring to the Holy Spirit holding Satan back now until God's done with the church. And then the church is out of here and the Holy Spirit goes back to glory with him and lets Satan have free reign, okay? With the exception of God's dominion over Satan. Verse 8, Then shall that wicked one be revealed, 
whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And again, I believe that's the Antichrist. Uh, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So how is Satan going to come to power? Lying wonders, miracles, all kinds of things, okay? Satan's going to be, he's going to, uh, miracle signs and lying wonders. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So there's the people that are left behind that maybe heard the word and didn't get saved. Look at verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be judged who, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the Bible is pretty dogmatic there that people that play with it and maybe go to church and you know, just decide it's not for them for now. I want uh, young people say, "Well, I'll get saved later on," but right now, I want to enjoy myself. You know, this kind of stuff. They're playing with fire, because if the rapture takes place tonight, the odds may go down real slim that they ever get saved, based on God sending them strong delusion that they believe the lies. Okay, so it, it, this this is what we're talking about on Sunday mornings about going out and witnessing. Keep this in the back of your mind with your loved ones that you'd like to see saved. The more they play around with it, the more they're putting themselves in jeopardy of being left behind and going to hell. So you need to, you need to keep that in mind, all right? Uh, but these witnesses are going to be unique. They're going to, be, uh, they're, going to, they're going to win a lot of people to Christ. There's a great multitude are going to be saved during this period. I think it's going to be predominantly Jews, okay? But it talks about in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 12, about a heavenly throng, great multitude that no man can number. All nations, all kindreds, all people, and all tongues clothed in white robes. Now, that can refer to both those of us that have already gone forward in the, is a, in the rapture, but also I believe there's going to be a great throng saved during this tribulation period because of the witness of those 144,000 people. There'll be millions of people saved. There's going to be millions more killed that go to hell. Okay? But these men are going to have great uh, harvest, of, particularly of the, in, the, in the Jewish nation, and I believe uh, probably in the Muslim nations as well around Jerusalem at this point. Uh, they're going to be clothed in white, white robes. Revelation chapter 19 is a, is, a, is a reference to that. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come. And his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, in reality, what does the Bible talk about? It talks about us being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Christ is, is imputing his righteousness to us. Here it's referred to the righteousness of the saints. But in reality, none of us are righteous, okay? It's the righteousness of Christ that's imputed unto us that makes us righteousness in his, in his sight, okay? But that's what we'll, we'll talk more about in Revelation chapter 19 about the marriage supper of the Lamb, We'll talk about, we'll go back and also pick up the judgment seat of Christ. You know, while this stuff is going on on earth, there's going to be stuff going on in heaven as well. Keep in mind there's a heavenly realm and an earthly realm here, okay? The heavenly realm, if we're raptured tomorrow, I believe we go up to, to the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be judged for our works, whether they be good or bad as believers. And then we'll be ushered into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And during that seven-year period, we're going to enjoy Christ, and we're going to enjoy the heavenly realm, and we're going to be glorified with, our, with, the, with the rewards that we get in the, at the judgment seat of Christ. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time in a banquet with our, with our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, enjoying heaven. Now, all this other hell's going, going on down here on the earth for seven years. So you, you can just choose which one you want to be involved in, okay? But that's where... That's what, what I see going on here. There's, there's the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, okay? Then we get to the seventh seal, and it starts with chapter 8 here of Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about an hour. Now, one of the things we did one night here is I had you sit, I think, for a couple minutes in silence, and even two or three minutes in silence, when there's total silence, is eerie. 
is deafening. You ever been in, uh, say, North Carolina in the, at night and it's dead silence except the cricket, crickets? <laughs> and they're so noisy, you know, all you can hear is crickets. Doug's always talking about the crickets chirping, okay? But imagine everything in heaven shut down for an hour. All the worship, all the moving around, and everything sits in silence for, for a half an hour. And it's a pause before the storm. Because when these trumpets start blowing, Christ is now starting to foreclose on his side of the title deed to the earth. The scroll has been opened, and he's ready to start foreclosing the exculpatory clauses, if you will, of a mortgage. He's going to one at a time start blowing trumpets and bringing out judgments to take back the title deed to the earth from Satan's rule and Satan's control. So really, what we're really seeing here is that spiritual battle going on between Satan who wants to, you know, when he was thrown out, into he thrown, thrown out of heaven in Isaiah chapter 14, he was going to exalt himself above God to be ruled as God. And that set in stage this spiritual battle between God and Satan. And, and this revelation is the culmination of that. We, we call it the consummation. It's the consummation of seven dispensations that are going to take place with God dealing with mankind. And this is the consummation of the first six dispensations, okay? So it says, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about an hour, and then becomes the seven trumpet judgments. Now, this, is, this ju trumpet is called the shofar. It's always been used by Israel to announce things, to herald things. Um, you know, when they blew trumpets walking around uh, 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 Jericho, it would have, been, would have been shofars that they blew. When I went to uh, Standing in the Gap back in 1997 with Promise Keepers, they started that morning, they started the worship service with the blowing of the shofar. It was really cool to have the shofar blown on the, caps, the capital steps of America, and it was blown into the sound system with a million six hundred thousand guys on the mall out there listening to the shofar being blown to bring us all to worship and glory together with Jesus Christ on the, on the Capitol Mall. It was pretty awesome. And then we worshiped Christ all day. But the shofar, is, it's, I don't know whether you've ever heard one blown. It's really cool. And uh, it, it, it's, th this is the idea of the trumpets here, okay? Uh, the seven trumpets being blown. The first trumpet was blown. You know, we hear, we hear a lot today about global warming. Well, global warming's coming. Okay? It just isn't man-made. It's Christ-made. And trust me, when Christ decides to bring global warming, there's nothing we're going to do to stop it. Because when he starts raining fire from heaven, and it starts burning up a third of all the plants and the trees and everything that's, that's, that's getting, uh, catching fire, it isn't man-made. It has nothing to do with you driving your SUV. Okay? It's all about Christ deciding that it's time to start pouring out his wrath on the earth and he's going to burn up a, th a third of all the foliage, all the trees, all the plants are going to be burned up by fire coming from heaven. Okay? Now he's going to give them a warning to blow the trumpet first, right? Now if they know the Bible, they might, not, they, they might know what's coming next, right? But in reality, nothing's going to stop it. This is Christ pouring out his wrath. Judgment, okay? Look at verse, go back to chapter 8, verse 7 here. I can't keep up with how fast I'm moving. The first angel sounded, and the, there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. One of the things I put in my notes here is, is imagine the massive cut in oxygen levels on the planet. And all of a sudden, people are going to have trouble breathing. Imagine. Instantly. It's not going to be a pretty sight. Okay? Uh, then the second trumpet blows. Talks about a great mountain being cast into the sea. 
Again, I don't know if we're talking earthquakes here or landslides or, uh, you know, meteorite from heaven or whatever. I don't know, you know, you can draw whatever conclusion you want, but it talks about a great mountain cast in the sea and the sea turns to blood. And a third of all the sea creatures die. A third of all people on ships are, are killed and the ships are destroyed. You know how many thousands of ships are on the ocean every day? You know, it, it, when this happens, 911 is going to be minuscule. One cruise ship has 2,000 people or more on it. And how many cruise ships are going out of Miami and Lauderdale every day? <laughs> and think around the world. And a third of them are going to be destroyed. Big deal. You know? You think, how can a loving God do that, right? No. He's a, God, he's a just God as well. Then the third trumpet sounds, and a great star falls from heaven. I think this is describing some type of meteor, meteor catastrophe. Uh, turns all the fresh water to wormwood. Once you've studied that out biblically, it's, it's poisonous. It's putrid to taste it and smell it. Um, I don't know, we have a little, little taste of it here every now and then in South Florida with what's called uh, uh, sulfur water. Anybody ever been over in Fort Myers area and, and drank uh, well water? It smells like rotten eggs, <laughs> you know. I don't know whether that's wormwood or not, but I don't want any part of it. But uh, this is going to make fresh water limited and very scarce on the planet. So you ask yourself, okay, with all this going on, where's, where's that lead man? Not in a good place. He's having trouble breathing. He doesn't have anything to drink. Uh, most of his plants have been burned up, so he's going to start starving to death. Uh, I mean, you, you think of the ramifications, it gets ugly quick. I got 15 minutes left on my battery here, Scott, so I got to move quick. <laughs> okay. um, the fourth trumpet sounds a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars are darkened. And this sets into place what's called the three woes. At this point, man is wanting it all to end. And sadly, it's just beginning. Okay? But God says there's going to be three woes that come. This is the first of the three woes here after the fourth trumpet judgment is sounded. Okay? A third of the sun is darkened, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. Then 200 million horsemen show up. Now, most people believe that's China from the east. Uh, last I knew, China had 200 million cavalry. Now, you have to keep in mind as we get to this stage, you say, well, you know, but military hardware today is all me mechanized, right? I was talking with a young man this morning in our church that works for, for Sikorsky Aircraft, and they're talking about a new form of Black Hawk helicopter that, that travels over 300 miles an hour and doesn't have to have a pilot to fight. It's all done electronically from somewhere else and using cameras to fly it, kind of like a big drone <laughs> with Tomahawk missiles <laughs> carried underneath it. So, I mean, the problem we have when all this stuff starts in this, particularly a third of the sun's darkened. Are any of our satellites going to work? And what happens to all these mechanized warfare at that point? Yeah, it's worthless. Our drones are worthless. And, and, and sorry, your cell phones aren't going to work. Your iPads aren't going to work. Your GPS in your car is not going to work. All that stuff's going to go away, folks. And we're going to be back to who has the biggest and the fastest horse is going to win. You know, I asked myself years ago, well, how does, how, how's, what, what's the need for Calvary at, the, at this point? A bunch of horses coming into Israel. What's that about? Well, that's going to be the, 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 back in the days of the chariots and the horses, those were the, were the you know, maybe the, the Hannibal and his elephants, you know, those were the, those were the war machines. So this is, this is totally realistic today, even though we're in our tech, technological world today, our technological world can go away in a heartbeat. And anybody with any intelligence knows that, okay? 
we can all be left in the dark tomorrow, just have a hurricane come through, right? I went 14 days, 11 days, and 13 days with three hurricanes two, in two years' time. Okay, right here in South Florida, here in Loxahatchee. So, you know, we can be without that stuff real quick. You know, we get used to it, and we think, oh, yeah, it'll never go away. Ask some, any of our kids. I can only imagine our young people when there is no cell phone and is no iPad. How long is it going to take them before they go through total withdrawals? <laughs> okay. You know, because they don't know how to live without them. You know. But even in a military sense, it's going to have its effect. All right. They come, actually, they come down onto Israel, and they're annihilated, and the blood's going to flow to the horse's bridle. I believe this is a, is a glimpse of Armageddon. They're going to be part of the armies at Armageddon. When Christ comes back and all the vultures are going to come to the battlefield and pick the bones of the, of the kings and, the, and the, the grunts. Okay? But this is a sign of the Armageddon here. Then the, seventh, the sixth trumpet blows in chapter 9, and what goes on here is God... Give, or Christ gives Satan the keys to the bottomless pit. And what we learn at this particular stage is God has a certain amount of demons now that he's allowed Satan to have here, his minions on earth at this point. But there are hundreds of millions more that, are, that, are, that have been cast into hell and are locked up at the present time. But God's going to give Satan, Christ is going to give Satan the key and he's going to unlock those other demonic powers that are in hell and they're going to come out and just permeate, uh, permeate the earth with their satanic uh, attacks. And then you read about the locusts with the scorpion tongues and when they sting them, sting people, they, they don't kill people, but when they sting them, the people are tormented for, for five, five months. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been stung by a scorpion or not, but trust me, one about that big will light you up. I felt something crawling on my leg one night in bed, and I went like this, and it was my... <laughs> and actually, I got up and I turned on the light. I probably figured, pretty much figured what it was. I turned on the light and couldn't find it. I found it the next day on the toe of my, of my tennis shoe on the floor. He wasn't but about that big. But boy, he lit me up. And I had a friend of mine years ago got bitten by one about that big, and I thought he went running down the street screaming and hollering. I thought he was going to die. So, I mean, scorpion bites are not good. This one torments them for five months, and it's pure satanic, okay? I don't know how to describe this. We talked a lot about it. I, it, it's, it describes itself here. You can study it all you want, but it's going to be ugly. The main thing you learn in chapter 9, verse 13 through 21 no matter how much God turns up the heat, Christ turns up the heat on mankind, you would think they would be on their face repenting. But the exact opposite happens. They stick their face, fist up in the air and they say, how dare you? Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, or of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Chapter 9, verse 13 through 21 is ugly about mankind, the heart of mankind. Sure. Because if Christians were left here, there's no doubt in my mind they'd be one of the Absolutely. 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 Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of support here. But uh, the main thing is, no matter how much he pours out his wrath on sinners, most of them continue to shake their fist in his face, who do you think you are? And reject it. You'd think they'd be on their face in repentance, but they're not. Okay? Then the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses. We, Revelation chapter 10 is, uh, is an announcement of the mighty, uh, no, no, more mighty no more further delays, and it's kind of a, what we call a uh, parenthetical teaching. Uh, John's prophecy uh, is repeated in chapter, verses 8 through 11. And then chapter 11, the two witnesses are introduced. It starts with John measuring the temple with the reed. And we learn there that when John measures the temple... He doesn't measure the Gentile court, which basically is telling us the Gentiles are excluded at this point. God is there to deliver Israel. It's their temple. Satan has desecrated their temple. And God measures it out. This is what I'm going to redeem. Is my temple from Israel, for Israel. It has nothing to do with the Gentiles. 
One of the problems a lot of people that try to translate or, or understand the Revelation is they try to put the church in Revelation. And it's after chapter 3, it's not. And if you put it in there, you're going to have a problem trying to make us part of this thing. It doesn't work that way. This is about Israel and redeeming their temple. And I believe this measuring of the temple is all about that because God leaves the Gentile court out of this measuring. Okay? So I believe it's all about Israel. Um, we're already in heaven. Another support for pre-tribulation rapture, in my opinion. Okay? But uh, the idea here is that God is dealing with Israel. He's going to deliver Israel when all nations, Satan turns all nations against Israel. God is going to deliver Israel from annihilation. And if you get to Matthew 24, it's a lot easier to understand Matthew 24, and you won't end up pre or post-tribulation rapture if the church is already gone in Matthew 24. What you see in the rapture in, the, in, the, in, in uh, Matthew 24 is at the end of Armageddon, I believe God is going to rapture a bunch of Jews out of there. Okay? But anyhow, that's a whole other thing. Here we see the two witnesses come to light in Revelation chapter, uh, Re Revelation chapter 11, 1 through 13. And uh, obviously the first thing that you hear from people is, who are the two witnesses? I don't care. <laughs> I mean, you, you can study about Elijah and Elisha and Enoch and, and Moses and all the reasons that one of those four guys ought to be the two witnesses. I really don't care who it is. All I know is there are going to be two men that God's going to ordain. They're going to come show up in the first half of the tribulation period. They're going to be able to, to consume people with fire out of their mouth. They're going to be invincible till God decides to let Satan uh, kill them halfway through the tribulation period. But these guys are going to turn the world upside down. They're going to be probably the leaders, if you will, of the 144,000 witnesses. But these guys are going to be a step above them. They're going to come back from glory and be the witnesses, okay? And uh, everyone's, that's everyone's first question. Again, they're going to witness in and around Jerusalem. They're going to lead millions to Christ. I believe they're going to lead, it, lead the, the teaching of the 144,000. And for two and a half, three years, they are going to win millions of people to Christ, okay? They're going to have the power, again, when somebody confronts them. If they don't like it, they just consume them with fire from their mouth. So it's going to be pretty awesome to watch it. Uh, halfway through the tribulation period, however, they're going to be killed. Revelation, chapter, uh, Revelation 11, 8 says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, and also their Lord was crucified. So we know that's Jerusalem, right? So they're going to lay for three days in the streets of Jerusalem. They're not even going to bury their bodies. It goes on and says there's going to be Christmas. Or everybody's going to be buying and giving presents to everybody because these three, two witnesses have been killed. The world's going to celebrate. Sinners are going to celebrate that these two witnesses have been killed. Trouble is their, their joy is short-lived because three days later they're going to resurrect from the dead. Those from the peoples and the tribes and the tongues and the nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in the tomb. They're going to rejoice and then the two witnesses are going to resurrect from the dead. And they're all going to see it live on television if it's left. <laughs> this is the second woe. Second woe is passed. There's one more woe to come. Now, the abomination of desolation has taken place at this point. Halfway through, I believe, this, this, when these witnesses resurrect from the dead, Satan is going to ramp it up. This is when Daniel chapter 9, he breaks the peace treaty with, peace treaty with Israel, and he sets himself up as God on the throne to be worshipped as the throne of God uh, and desecrate the temple. Okay? And, and that's, that's at this point. This is halfway through the tribulation period. As a matter of fact, as you study this out, the, the seven-year period, which we get from Daniel chapter 9, which we looked at the sabbatical calendar of Daniel chapter 9, and we talked about the, seven, the 70th week of Daniel that's missing. We spent a lot of time developing that. Uh, and that's this tri great tribulation period. But when you get to the tribulation period, that seven-year period is broken into two equal halves. As a matter of fact, it breaks it down to the months, and it also breaks it down to the actual days of the three and a half year periods. So God at this point is being very specific on the time frame. Okay? So halfway through this tribulation period, 
Satan's going to break his, break his peace treaty with Israel that we see back in Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 9. Sorry, guys, I changed my mind. You're not, you can't do your temple worship anymore because it's now my temple. Get out of my temple. And he's going to break the peace treaty with Israel. And he's just, the Antichrist, we've been working with the false prophet up until now, which I believe is going to be the Pope. You can see this in a minute. I believe he's going to be the Pope of the Roman Church. And then I believe the 12th Imam is going to be revealed as the Antichrist is going to take over the temple worship or the temple in Jerusalem and set himself up as God to be worshipped in the temple. And it's going to happen halfway through this tribulation period. Okay? So that's what I see happening here. Uh, the, at this time, the witnesses are, are, are raptured. The Antichrist is set up in the temple. And then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> okay? Remember, we're at the seventh trumpet. All right? Christ has poured out six judgments on mankind. Mankind sticking their face in his, sticking their fist in his face. Who do you think you are? Okay? They don't want to hear it. The witnesses are witnessing. People are getting saved. The two witnesses have been witnessing. Now they've watched them re resurrected from the dead. They're still sticking their fist in his face saying, who do you think you are? And Satan sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped as God. And that's where we're at at the end of chapter 11. Okay? Chapter 12 and 13, it only gets worse. Um, we see in chapter 13, two beasts come out of, one comes out of the earth, one comes out of the sea. I believe these are referencing to the false prophet and the Antichrist himself. Okay? The false prophet being the lion with the heads and all this kind of stuff. You can read the symbolization there. I've heard pastors talk about it, the Roman church and the seven uh, mountains in Rome, and each one has its head, and, and talked about nations are going to line themselves, and these different kings, the different, I mean, it, it, you can, you can go, get on the internet and go in, infinitum on all the different ideas about what all this means. I don't get bogged down in that, okay? All I know is there's a, a I believe it's the Pope of Rome is going to be the, 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 the false prophet at this point. Now, I'm going to go back for some of you that haven't been in, in this study uh, before, when I used to teach a lot of this stuff and hear it taught back 43 or 4 years ago, it was always the Pope of Rome was going to be the Antichrist. And the false prophet, we weren't sure. But I really, I see it much clearer today, I believe, in the fact that I believe the Pope of Rome is going to be the one that brings the Kumbaya, brings all the, the, the religious, world religions together. Up until about 15, 18 years ago, I'd never heard of the 12th Imam, who is the Messiah of Islam that's coming, supposedly, according to the Quran. And I believe that now that the 12th Imam, that the Pope, and we see this, the Pope aligning himself with all the world religions and trying to bring all the world religions together to have a kumbaya moment, and I see the Pope, this Pope we've got now doing more than any Pope I've ever seen in my lifetime trying to bring all that together. You know, and on top of that, he's reaching out to the Islamics. And his doctrine is so flawed. Oh, it's, it's crazy. It's, I, it's, I he's all into social justice, which is exactly what Satan's going to use to come to power is social justice. Okay? And this new pope is all about social justice. Okay? So I see this pope doing setting the stage again, even more than any pope I've ever seen in my lifetime, setting the stage for what's getting ready to take place. It's another reason I believe we're in the last days, and this pope, he may or may not be the false prophet, but he's certainly, if he's not, he's setting the stage for the false prophet. Okay? And it's all going to be about social justice, feeding the poor and looking out for the little guy and bashing the rich and famous. Okay? Uh, but then... The second beast that's, that's introduced here, I believe, is the false prophet. And notice it comes as a lamb. I.e. Yeah. Okay. And it also has a mortal wound and resurrects from the dead. So what's that all about? Well, all I see is Satan trying to do everything he can to copy Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did to give legitimacy to his, to his Antichrist, okay? 
I mean, the witness is resurrected from the dead, so don't you think that uh, uh, Satan has to resurrect his guy from the dead to have legitimacy? You want to make a comment, Scott? You, you, admit, you called that the false prophet. Uh, did I? No, it's the Antichrist. Yeah, the, I'm sorry, the Antichrist. Uh, so, you know, I believe that he's going to try to bring his Antichrist on the level of, of Christ himself through this mortal wound and, and resurrection from the dead and him being meek as a lamb. I believe he's going to be a charismatic, soft-spoken, have-all-the-answer type of guy, okay? And I believe that's, that's the 12th imam is, is, is when he comes, that's how he's going to approach it, okay? Here we see my guest today. If the rapture took place tomorrow and this was to take place, we'd probably see these two guys come to power. Now, I don't know where the 12th imam is in that, but this new pope, he's kind of uh, putting this whole thing together. He's, he's, he's greasing the skids for what's coming, in my opinion, okay? And we don't know who the 12th Imam is, but the 12th Imam is going to come out of turmoil. As a matter of fact, Iran, that's their theology, is to bring about, that's why they're so much into worldwide terrorism, is because they believe by bringing about terror in the world and bringing about confusion in the world, that will set the stage for the 12th Imam to come and bring peace. And that's the teachings of the Quran. So it's to their benefit to reap terror and havoc on the world to try to bring the world around so the 12th Imam can come and bring peace. So I see these, these two churches, Islam and the Roman Catholic Church, aligning itself together as the one world religion as the 12th Imam sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped as God. And the more I've thought about it over the years and, and leaned towards this direction, this goes back to the whole idea back in the time of Abraham when he was given his, ha his handmaiden Hagar and they had the illegitimate child Ishmael which is the forerunners of the Arab nations and actually is the, is the centerpiece, if you will, of Islam, is Ishmael, not Isaac. So for Ishmael, to his lineage, to set themselves up as God in the temple, to be worshipped as God, goes back to the fact that Abraham pushed Ishmael out of his life and told Agar, go take a hike. This isn't my promised son. And so this spiritual warfare goes on and leave it to Satan to grab a hold of that theology, bring about a whole new religion under, un, under Muhammad, and we now are dealing with Islam based on that ad adultery that took place back in the days of, of Abraham and, and Hagar and, and an illegitimate child, if you will, and now that's the one that's going to be set up as, a, as the twelfth imam on the, in the temple to bring about the desecration of, of, the, of the Jewish temple. So that's kind of how I see all this fitting together from a theological standpoint. And these two religions, the false Christianity, which is Roman, Roman Catholicism at this point, aligning itself with a totally false religion, Satan's religion, Islam. Okay? So we got false Christianity and false Messiah wealthy mom aligning themselves to be the world religion. So it all fits to me real easy. And again, that's all chapter 12. Chapter, thir uh, chapter 12 also, the false prophet in chapter 14, or, or chapter 13 I think it is, he's the false prophet. He makes an image of the Antichrist and he's able to give the, the image the power and, and, he, and the image can speak and all this kind of stuff. And we have all that technology today. I mean, uh, uh, how many love what Pixar does? I mean, you know, even cartoons are realistic today. And so we've got all this technology for the Antichrist to make an image. And if you don't worship the image of the beast, you're killed. This, after three and a half years, this becomes totalitarian rule. You've heard about the number, mark of the beast, right? Daniel chapter 13, or Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 18 talks about humans are going to be forced to take a mark or you don't buy or sell. It's going to be in your forehead or the back of your right hand. Now, we used to think years ago about tattooing and stuff. Well, today it's gone to the next level. We now have the microchip. Okay? And microchips can be put under your skin that people don't even know it's there. It can be scanned. 
Uh, it's unobtrusive. We're already putting them in dogs' ears and different things and be using them in, in stuff. In some cases, in some countries, they're already putting them in babies when they're born. Okay? So this is all coming. And the issue is, at what point, and I've said this when we talked to, about Spencer, a night on this whole deal, I've, I've asked the Church of Jesus Christ here at Cornerstone, at what point are we no longer going to allow our young ladies to go have a baby at the hospital? Because she's not going to be dismissed until she's got the chip in her right hand or her forehead, or his right hand or his forehead. See? At some point, if, if the church, if, this, if, if Jesus tarries, and particularly if we're pre-trib or post-trib, church has a lot of decisions to make <laughs> on what we're going to do. Because the Bible says if you take this mark, you go to hell. Okay? So this is a definitive issue here. And it's, very, it's, it's, it's in place today. The technology is there. It's being used with all the credit card fraud, all the, the, the identity fraud. It's the perfect solution from man's standpoint. Human wisdom tells us, man, you put a chip in your hand, it's, it's, it's foolproof, right? Have all your medical records in there, have all your financial records in there, man, you're good to go. So somebody wants to cut off your hand and use it. Right. <laughs> okay. But, you know, again, it's human wisdom is going to bring this stuff about. We have the technology today. And the Bible says that you're not going to buy or sell unless you take the smart. Now, what that's going to do, if you don't buy or sell and you start to beg food, somebody's going to turn you in and you're going to lose your head. So you'll become a martyr. Okay? So it, it's, it's, this is all Satan's deal, dealing here, all right? Here's the chip. Baby's foot. You know, it shows how small it is. Then we get to chapter uh, 15. And we're introduced back to the day of the Lord. Okay? And, uh... Uh, da, 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 da. I'm, I'll be, okay, 14. I'm sorry, 14. The day of the Lord, the Lord uh, comes and stands on Mount Zion. Where's Mount Zion? That's Temple Mount. That's Temple Mount, downtown Jerusalem. Actually, it's south end of Jerusalem, right? Christ coming back. Again, this is a picture of the end, at the beginning of the end, if you will, when he comes back to stand on the Mount Zion and claim what's his. Okay? Then we have a vision here, a chapter, of chapter 14, verse 6, a vision of the everlasting gospel. And then in verses 9 through 13, we have a vision of the doom to come. And notice the, the, the scripture here in, uh, the, the key, this is an absolute key scripture that if you don't have it marked in your Bible, you probably ought to mark it. Verse, I want to read verses 9, but primarily verse 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is, which is uh, poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receives the mark of his image. Here is patience of the, of the saints. Here are they that have kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So at this point, for people to take this mark that we've talked about is going to doom them to torments for eternity in hell. No rest day and night forever. Okay? The talking about God's wrath being poured out. This is going to get to the, to the bold judgment, so we're going to get to in chapter 15. God is going to start pouring out his wrath from this point forward on the earth without grace. Without measure, it says. So the total wrath of God, the consuming fire of God, is going to come down 
in these last few years with the vile judgments. And that's where we are at chapter 15, is the beginning of the vile judgments, all right? Uh, the vile judgments talks about the treading of the wine press. Look at uh, chapter uh, 14, verses, uh, let's start at verse, uh, how far do we have to back up? Uh, let's go back up to verse 14. And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having in his hand a golden crown, and, in, and on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another came up out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to carry him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the winepress of the wrath of God. I've got in my Bible here in parentheses the valley of Megiddo. This is Armageddon here. And the wine press was trodden outside of the city. The blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. We call that the Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon is going to take place in the Valley of Megiddo. If you've ever seen pictures of it, it's like a big bowl. I think it's about seven or eight miles wide and like 26 miles long or something like that. And that's where the armies are going to gather to try to destroy Israel. And Christ is going to come back and stomp on them till the blood flows to the horse's bridles. And that's what's described here in chapter 14, or the end, the end of chapter 14. Okay? It's going to be really, really, really ugly. No grace, total judgment, God's wrath poured out at the end of the tribulation period. Now, in the meantime, this key that I want you to focus on here is this whole idea of without measure. Because from chapter 13, the taking of the mark of the beast, till the end of the tribulation period, when these vile judgments are poured out, it's without grace. Totally without grace. And that's not pretty. Um, the day of the Lord also talks about the, the, the day of Armageddon uh, verses 14 8 through 20 you can read about that we just read about the treading of the wine press but really this is when when we come back we're going to get more into this uh, in Revelation chapter 20 uh, you know when we come back to with Christ when he comes back to, to uh, in, in, he came the first time as a servant to be killed and sacrificed for our sins. He's coming back in the, at the second time to rule and reign and judge the earth for sin. He's coming on the white horse. We're coming with him. And we're going to watch him wipe the planet into oblivion with the exception of the ones that he delivers out of tribulation, which is going to be primarily the Jews. Okay? And that's what the day of the Lord is all about. We're going to read more about that in Revelation chapter 17 and 19 and uh, talk more about Armageddon later on, but this is glimpses of it now. Now, one of the things I want to go back to, this is, goes back to our first lesson. <clears throat> the Bible talks about when John was first called to write the book in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant uh, John, I pointed out, if you look at the Greek on that word, uh, must shortly come to pass, shortly come to pass, that, that term, it's, ha it's not talking about a short period of time as much as it is rapid succession. And when you think about all the stuff we've talked about tonight, it takes place in seven years. All this stuff that we're talking about, including the vile judgments, which we haven't talked about yet, and including the, the, the Armageddon, which we haven't really gotten into yet. But all that stuff takes place in seven years. 
And that's what that scripture is talking about. Right from the first verse of Revelation chapter 1, these things must shortly come to pass. That's a Gatling gun. I don't know if you've ever seen the old westerns when they use the Gatling guns, you know. And uh, that's, that's, that's what that's about, all right. So all this stuff takes place. We've got 21 judgments in Revelation. We've got sealed judgments. We've got six of those, and then the seventh one is the, the trumpet judgments. We've got seven trumpet judgments, which we've just been through. And then in chapter 15, now this is a chart I gave you several months ago about what takes place in the heavenly realm the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the rapture of the witnesses, okay? Jesus returned to glory. We see the tribulation period being broken into two, uh, three and a half year periods, once being the false priest, the other abomination of desolation. The false prophet comes to power, the 144 witnesses preach on the, during that false peace area. Then the desecration of the temple and the Antichrist comes to power in the second three and a half years. And it's called the Great Tribulation, Jacob's Trouble in the Times of the Gentiles. So that'll give you an idea from a flow chart, if you will, on what's taking place here, okay, in this seven-year period. And almost done here. We end up with the seven bowl judgments, seven vile judgments, however you want to call it, starting in chapter 15, where we, we're, we're start, going to start our lessons back, uh, crank them back up after tonight, okay? And I'd just like to read verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. There they are. And we're going to start talking in coming weeks about the vile judgments. But notice the magnitude of these judgments filled up with the wrath of God without grace. So you tell me whether you want to be post-trib or not. <laughs> okay. that's, why I'm, that's why I believe in chicken theology. I don't want any part of God pouring out his wrath when it's filled up with wrath and it's without grace. I don't see him pouring that out on his bride. Okay. So I don't believe we're going to be here. And I want to leave you with that hope tonight.